in three, two, one, and we're live. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? How about no, you crazy Dutch bastard? <laughs> What we've got here is failure to communicate. 60% of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. That's cute. I remember when I had my first beer. Why so serious? I am serious. I don't call me sure. What's up, everybody? It's the DTD podcast. Do that deed. Every week we come to you with a new story, and this week is no different. We have an amazing story for you. A guy that started out playing guitars in high school, joined the Army, became a Ranger, became a Delta operator, got back out, and got back into the music business. And I got to tell you, he's got an amazing story from missions in the past and missions that he's doing for the future. So without further ado, Brad Thomas is joining us. He served in the United States Army from 1990 to 2010. He served in the Ranger Regiment with with uh, 3rd Platoon Bravo Company, 3rd Ranger Battalion, and then as a recon element. During October of 1993, Brad served in Operation Gothic Serpent with 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment in Mogadishu. It's more commonly referred to as Black Hawk Down. He served 10 more, uh, excuse me, 12 more years in Delta Force, a Tier 1 Special Operations Group. While serving in the Army, he received two Combat Infantry Badges, four Bronze Stars with two Valor Designations, two Joint Service Commendations with two Valor Designations, Special Forces Tab, Ranger Tab, High Altitude Low Opening Parachutist Badge, Jump Master Badge, Foreign Jump Wings, he left the Army in 2010 and became lost about what he wanted to do with his life. His wife had an idea. You have all this music and all of this equipment, so why don't you do something for veterans with your music? And that's where we get today with his band, Silence and Light. Without further ado, let us welcome a national hero. Brad, welcome to the show. What's going on, man? Hey, I'm just a regular dude that just happen to be surrounded by great people. So, you know, it's, it's hard for me to sit and listen to, to the uh, introduction because I just feel like I'm the same 17-year-old snapper head that I was, you know, back in 1986. And I think to an extent that's all of us in, in everything that we've done in life. But I, I really feel on this show, I try and tell people stories and, and I want to – I want people to know exactly what they've done, what they've been through, because I think more than ever today, credibility is a huge thing. Yeah. Um, and, and so when you can show someone, look, I've been there, I've done that. I understand what you're going through. It helps out a lot. I saw a, I'm, I try not to ever be negative on social media and the things that I do. I try and be positive. I don't get into politics. I don't get into stuff like that. I've got my own beliefs and my own thoughts on things, but I try just to keep all that out because the thing that I'm, that I'm trying to do and what I'm doing with this music project is, is to bring people together. So I don't want to be divisive, but to your point, I see some of the biggest frauds on, on social media and they have, some of them have an incredible following and it's, it's disturbing to me. So part of me wonders why more people don't call them out. And, you know, hey, let's see the resume. I mean, your DD-214 isn't, isn't classified. It's given to you when you retire. So uh, anyway, it's just annoying to me. Well, that, that kind of leads me into a first question then. So, you know, and you kind of said how you feel, but how do you feel about these guys that come on there? And that, that's their whole video thing. That's their whole social media thing is to call out other services or call out other politics or things like that. What's your thought on it? Because me – I, I think some people have a legitimate concern. I think they have legitimate things that they say, but I think there's a lot of guys out there, like you said, that are just spouting off. And there's, there's, you know, where you used to be at was a very in your face, check yourself society. It, it's not like that out in the world. People aren't going to do that anymore. People are non-confrontational. And so you get a lot of this 
uh, vitriol and this uh, just piss and vinegar out of people that don't know what they're talking about, and it leads to bad things. Sure. I mean, people can say whatever they want, and if they have an audience, then they can say it to more people than just their mom in their basement, you know? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Like, I'm fortunate to have a following on social media that I can put out information to, and I try and do... Uh, things that are informative and do things that let people know what what I'm doing and what I've done and things like that. So it's an incredible tool that can be used, you know, one way or the other. In terms of like calling folks out, um, I'm not into the whole, you know, like stolen valor or figure that, you know, right. from what I've seen mostly is is that people use ambiguity about their career and they don't say no to something. So what I mean is, um, you know, they post a picture, they insinuate that they were in maybe a special mission unit. Uh, maybe they were in a special mission unit as a support person, but they lead people to believe that they were more than just a support person. There's nothing wrong with being a support person. Absolutely. And, you know, that's, but, but they kind of use that ambiguity and, and the not answering a question as means of furthering their agenda that's that's what i see a lot of yeah i i, I agree with you lying. you know it's not guys that are like oh, i was a colonel in special forces and they were never in the army <laughs> right <laughs> i was an astronaut i was this and yeah. that yeah uh, and you know and uh, but i think that leads to a bigger thing today and and you know you said you don't get into politics and i i don't get into politics on here either um, I, I believe, though, that that has led to a lot of what's wrong with what's going on in society today is that uh, that that silent majority or those people that have been there, done that, or the people that are serious about this country have kind of gone silent for a little while. Yeah, I think that. And I think that uh, I think the majority of us kind of make up this this great big ball that's in the middle. And mm -hmm. you might lean a little bit one way or the other, but the majority of people that I've met, and I meet thousands of people a year, um, they're, they're all kind of right in the middle. Everybody kind of has the same beliefs. We all want things to be better. And unfortunately, the media portrays this far side over here and this far side over here because that's what gets ratings. That's what sensationalizes right. things. That's what grabs headlines and makes sound bites and everything else. And that's the unfortunate part. So I, even within my own family, people that I don't necessarily agree with politically, we're, we're very rational and can have a conversation about something. And that's what I found majority of us are like that. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we see the extreme side. So that's why I just stay out of it. You know, I'm in that ball of people in the middle. Like, right. Why, why worry about it? Why stress about it? Let's, you know, live life. Right. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. So getting off that, let's talk about you for a little while. Uh, as a teenager, uh, I have that you were risk taking, long haired, wild man who loved partying, uh, watching horror movies, and most of all, playing guitars. First off, let's talk about uh, the, the horror party. movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the well, you know, I think it all kind of surrounds itself with each other. So, you know, the partying, the horror movies. Um, how does someone that, that is, you know, kind of um, labeled as that, how do you go from there to the most top tier of operators in the world? Well, that's, that's a long journey. So number, number one, that's a long journey. Um, I didn't have the first clue what I wanted to do in terms of, like I had no desire to be in the military. There was, there was none of that growing up. I wanted to be a professional musician, from the time I was like four. And uh, the military thing was something that kind of came as a result of, you know, not making it in music and making a decision to do something. And, uh, you know, so I, I played music from the time I was a really little kid. I loved music. And the army recruiter, when I turned 18, would call me and be like, you know, the army's got a band, you can join the army band. And, you know, like, no, nah, that's not what I want to do, man. <laughs> Um, and th there was a period of time in my early teens, like maybe 12, 13, 14, where I read a lot of uh, Vietnam books, Rangers in Vietnam, CIA in Vietnam, stuff like that. And so I found it interesting. And, and anyway, kind of the music thing ran its course and it got to the point where it's like, all right, I'm 21. Uh, 
this isn't panning out the way that, that I wanted it to. And I, I think I could have gone at it again. It, it's, it's with music and with bands, it takes forever to build this thing. That's, I, I think that most people don't realize it, but it takes forever. You know, you go through three different drummers and then you get, you move along and you get to a place where you're like, all right, we've got the crew and then dude moves. And then, you know, it's just like that thing just continues to happen. So you get to a point where you work so hard and you get it to a place where you think it's going to work and everything's jiving. And then, you know, some catastrophe happens and you're basically left rebuilding. So that's kind of what happened to me. The, the guys that I was playing with when I was, when I was younger, kind of, it all fell apart at the very end. And it was like me and the drummer and, and that's it. So like, now we got to find a singer. Like, when are we going to find another singer? Now we got to find another bass player. You know, we just got to go through this whole thing again. So I, I kind of was fed up with that. And I had a buddy that had joined the Air Force. And he came home on, uh, on leave and was telling me about these guys that came. So he had just gone through basic training in, like, AIT. And he, he was home on vacation. And he, he said, at the end of basic training, these guys came. And they were trying to recruit for this special unit in the Air Force that like jumps behind enemy lines and rescues down pilots. And it was the first time that, you know, since I had read these Vietnam books, that all of a sudden, like, the hairs, you know, started standing up on it. Right. Like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So within a couple of weeks, um, and at the same time, over that same period, so he was home probably Christmas time of, of like 1989. Uh, at the same time, the Rangers jumped into Panama and that was on the news. And I saw that. Um, and it was one of those things that kind of, you know, did the same thing. Like the spidey senses got all excited about it. So, uh, within maybe a month, I was at the air force recruiter trying to sign up for the pararescue job and they couldn't give me any kind of guarantee. And so I spent a number of weeks going back and forth you know, oh, we'll give you a contract. We'll do this. We'll do that. And he was lying to me the whole time. And one right. day I was, I was leaving the Air Force recruiter and the Army guy pulls me in and he's like, hey, um, you know, what's, what's that guy telling you? And I said, well, he keeps telling me he's going to give me a contract, but he's not giving me a contract. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I go, like Delta Force. And he goes, you can't do that. You got to do something first, like Special Forces. And I said, well, OK, I, I'll do that. And he goes, well, you can't do that either you got to do something before that, like a ranger. And I go, okay, well, I'll do that. So uh, it was like a, a long process to, to get out of, because I already kind of signed papers with the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of a long process and everything. But, um, you know, basically that was that was how I came to be in the military. It was definitely not a, a well thought out plan or anything else. It was just kind of like, that sounds cool. I'll go do that. And, and so we're completely ignorant of what that, you know, like, what that process was. I had no idea and didn't even ask. Well, and, but I think you have to be of a certain uh, mindset to go into that. You know, even though you don't know anything about it, you know, that going into special forces, I mean, you've read the books and stuff, you know, that it takes a certain kind of individual, you know, it takes a very uh, mentally prepared person. They're not just going to jump into that thing. Um, so, is that the way that you approached everything as a teenager before that, like with the music and all that kind of stuff? Was it just headlong, but you knew I'm just going to have to grind this out? Or is, is that how you've been built pretty much your whole life? Or did that kind of forge as you were in the military? Yeah, I think I think at a young age, I was a cautious little kid and at a really young age. And I think over over time, I don't know what gave me the the risk taking you know, kind of thing, but it just started to kind of grow. And I remember, um, even as a real little guy, like four years old, doing some pretty dangerous stuff in nursery school, and then, you know, like hit a kid in the head with a brick and got in all kinds of trouble for that, you know, the, that, that was kind of the... Kind of so the that, that was more risky for the kid that took the brick than you. Yeah, it, was, you know, it, was, it was just one of those things. But yeah, I, I think pretty much I'm when I do stuff, I, I go all in, you know, it's, it's right. not like, well, let me feel this out and I'm, I'm all in and, and it becomes me, you know? Right. So you go to basic, I, I guess you sign up as infantry, uh, that's yes. on your contract. So you, you go to basic, uh, do you find right off the bat when you get there? Like, I love this. This is great. I, I can't believe I waited this long to do this. Or was it a, 
a transition. No, I, I hated it. And I, I got to a reception battalion. So I, I didn't understand this. And again, it's like, I didn't, I probably asked the recruiter questions, you know, and probably, probably got truthful answers, but I didn't really understand the process. I didn't understand that like basic training was different than AIT and AIT was different from airborne school. And, and like, I didn't really understand the process. So I got to the reception battalion and <clears throat> most people probably don't know this, but you don't just go right to basic training. You, go, <laughs> you spend you that week in, you spend about a week in a reception battalion and, and they kind of, they do your haircut and they, teach you how to stand in line and you fill out all these forms and you get all kinds of shots and stuff like that. And, uh, at the time, you know, the military was drawing down. There wasn't, there wasn't, when I first joined in, in, uh, signed the paperwork in like May of 90, it was a very picky military. They didn't have to take you. They, they didn't need a whole lot of people. And so they were very restrictive. Like they were, don't say that you use drugs. If you have any sort of alcohol related offense, they wouldn't even take you. It was just like if you had a DUI or something like that, they wouldn't right. even wouldn't even talk to you. So anyway, over the summer, so that was May of 90, over the summer, uh, Desert Shield kicked off. And all of a sudden the army found itself ramping up for the Persian Gulf War. And the the floodgates opened and they started accepting everybody. So when I got to the reception battalion, um, and I want to be very careful about how I describe the folks that I was surrounded by uh, because I wouldn't take anything away from them, but it was just, it definitely was not um, the type of people that I thought that I was going to be surrounded by. And I didn't understand that I had a ranger contract. So I had a guarantee to at least go through the pipeline, which was basic uh, AIT airborne. And then the ranger indoctrination for like, they at least guaranteed me, the opportunity if I physically made it through. Right. Um, and I didn't understand that everybody else was in under a different circumstance and not necessarily in the same circumstances as I was in. So anyway, when I, when I first got to reception battalion, it was, it was like, I, I don't want to be here. This is horrible. I don't like these people. Uh, I had like some cash that got stolen and, you know, it was just like low lives. There were a lot of real, real kind of, shady dudes there and i had a guy in my basic that uh didn't wear shoes like before yeah. he came to basic like he was like well you know i mean like he had had shoes on but he's like we don't wear shoes all the time i was like gotta be kidding me yeah so anyway that's that's kind of how it started off and and i i didn't dig that i think once i got to basic training and me and the other guys that all had similar we were almost like cookie cutter people like all had very much the same upbringing. Um, we all just kind of came from like the suburbs of America and, and all got along and all of us were in, in my, I think company, we had like 12 of us that had ranger contracts and we instantly kind of clung together, you know, that became the crew. And so did you, after basic, did you see these people as you went through the process? I mean, were they, right alongside you or was yeah. it kind of spread out or so, so me and uh me and a guy that came into MEP center together who was also named brad um he and i were like through basic through airborne through everything together and then both went to third ranger battalion he went to a different company but oh wow and then we both went to the same selection and we both got selected at the same uh delta selection oh wow so, yeah it's pretty cool you think about you know that 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 thing starts to neck down, you know, the further up you go right. in the military and uh, the chances that both of us made it and were healthy and had, had the luck on our side and everything else is pretty cool. Yeah, I definitely think that is. So we go through all this stuff. You get through uh, Ranger School, you get through Airborne, uh, you get assigned out. Uh, let's go from there about you, you get over into the, you, you go straight to the regiment, correct? Yeah, so you go through... You don't go to ranger school. You go to the ranger indoctrination, the indoctrination right? The RIT and, program. And at, at the time, it was just kind of like a three-week suck fest. It wasn't like right. I don't really remember that I learned anything. It was just kind of like hazing for three weeks. And I had a, a layover. I had like a holdover before that. So I had like an additional three weeks of hazing. Ooh. So it was, it was a ton of fun. But 
I did that and then, yeah, got assigned. Um, when I went through the, the Ranger indoctrination program, they were, they were like, you could pick what battalion you wanted to go to. But since my last name started with a T, I was concerned that everybody was going to pick the battalion I wanted to go to. And therefore I wouldn't get it because it would already be filled. So I figured if I pick, um, third ranger battalion, nobody really wants to be there because it's on Fort Benning and, you know, the reputation is that it sucks and everything else. So I ended up just picking that and I was tired of moving. I was tired of living out of double right. bag and, uh, and thought I can move. I could see the place that I was moving to, you know, and that, that's why I picked it. So that's where I ended up. And so how long after going there, did you go to actual ranger school? So I got, I got super lucky, um, and sent at, at the time, you know, you would be a private and once you would prove yourself, they kind of give you a little more responsibility. And now you're kind of like watching over the other privates that were newer right. and that kind of thing. Um, when I got to my squad in B company, I was like the 12th dude. So I got there in April of 91. And uh, because of this whole influx after Panama and after Desert Storm, there was like a huge influx into the Ranger Regiment. So I got there in April. There, there were 12 other guys in my squad. And by that September, there were four of us. And that was a squad leader, two team leaders, and me. Wow. So... I was the only one in my platoon at the time that passed the pre-ranger PT test. And so they were like, Hey man, you know, you're, you're, you got a chance of a lifetime to go and uh, you know, we're going to send you to ranger school. And I had only been there like five months at the time, you know, generally speaking, a private would be there for probably between nine to 12 months. In some cases, maybe if, you know, there were a number of guys ahead of them, um, you know, it might take them a little longer to get to ranger school, but ranger school was like the first stepping stone to having a, you know, having a longer career there. Uh, you can't be a leader without a ranger tab. So right. that's a, a prerequisite. So you, you're not going to move up if you don't have it. And so what, what rank are you when you go? Um, private. So PB2. You, you, oh, wow. <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're kind of behind the power curve right there. Uh, yeah, I getting got, there I, because you you got guys that are coming in from all over that are a higher rank that have more experience, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean they're lieutenants and captains, right. and Staff sergeants from the regular army, and even platoon sergeants from the regular army that I was in there with. So it was uh, all it was. It was here you go, man. You're you're there, PB two Thomas. And so do you lay back in the cut or do you, do you jump right in with the rest of those guys or do you kind of watch to learn kind of their, maybe take some different leadership styles because, you know, that's. It was like drinking from the fire hose and, right. you know, it was really drinking from the fire hose and just having the guts and determination not to quit, you know, and make it through and make it through by the like seat of my pants probably. Um, now, when you went through how many phases? Four. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was, uh, I think 71 or 72 days back then. And, uh, still had the desert phase and everything else. And it was, right. it was interesting because I wouldn't say that, um, having the desert phase and, and the desert phase going away and then we're in the war in the desert. I, I don't think that like they're two different animals. It really, it was really about just having a different environment and understanding and learning how different patrolling is in different environments okay. and the physiological effects, you know, of being in a really high arid mountainous, you know, 6,000 foot elevation desert and what right. it does to your body and, and everything else. So it, it wasn't like, here's how you do things. And, and they teach you how to do things in a desert. It's, the same principles that apply in the jungle apply in the desert and in the mountains and everywhere else you could be. It's just on a different scale, you know, but physiologically and it, it, it was harder. I, I believe just because, you know, you're coming out of um, coming out of the desert phase, then going to mountains and then from there to Florida. And, and so it, I feel like it was pretty hard on the body. Right. So, uh, favorite phase, least favorite phase. 
<laughs> they they all suck. <laughs> I think I think the uh, the very first phase, the Darby phase, was probably the worst, just because that was kind of setting the tone, and you were living in the barracks kind of part of the time, and uh, you know, just constant messing with you and stuff like that. And um, yeah, that that was that was probably my least favorite. And at least when you got together phases, it was kind of like away from the flagpole. It was just different, right? So you, you get through Ranger School, you go back. Um, how fast do you gain rank? Because uh, you're still, I'm sure you're still private when you're done. Yeah, so you go from, uh, in the Ranger Regiment, when you graduate Ranger School, you're automatically E4. Okay. So, so you go basically from whatever rank you go. Most people go as E3. Right. Uh, and then and then they throw on your E4 rank. But yeah, I kind of got fast track right to E4. Well, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing. No. And, and also then too, it was, um, you know, it, it took me a little while to get through. I didn't, I didn't just go straight sailing straight through ranger school. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like the extended, the extended course. <laughs> do, do, <laughs> due to like injuries or what, what happened? No, uh, you know, graded patrols and things like that. And, I got. I I, had, I hate those group uh, grading sessions. Yeah, it was it, much longer story than I care to get into. But <laughs> I had I had a a lot of the guys that were in my platoon in B Company when I first got there, um, left for whatever reason and were out at the Ranger School as instructors when I got there, and so I showed up and they were like, "What the f are you doing here? You're a brand new guy," and so they they had a pretty good time with me and, and kind of did some things that were, I think looking back were pretty crappy. Um, and a, a couple of them apologized about it later, you know, as we crossed paths and, and things like that. But uh, like they made me the, the company first sergeant. And so, so administratively, you know, I'm marching the, the company I'm right. doing, you know, and again, it's like, I'm an E2. I, I came here um, and I get what they were, what they were doing, but um Anyway, it was kind of like penalizing me for being the most squared away private in the platoon. Like, right. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry I passed the, the PT test and I'm the only one that goes, you know? Right. Sorry, yeah. but, and, like, and I'm sure that created probably a little animosity back in your unit, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, cause it's, it's one of those things, like we talked about, it's a, a prove yourself. And if you haven't, which... I mean, technically, if we look at it, you had proven yourself. You were the only one to pass the the test to get in and stuff. So you had proven yourself. But I think in in people's eyes, uh, you were like, "Eh, I don't think he has." He, you know, and and people will make all kinds of excuses. He just got out of training. He's this. He's in better shape. He's this. So people will do that. And so you go, you make it through. Now, how long did you actually spend there? Um, close to seven. Seven phases altogether. So oh it was supposed to be four phases, but I did <laughs> I did seven. Wow. So, yeah. So you you get done, you go back, um, get back into just regular I, I don't want to say regular army life, but you get back into a rhythm, back in your unit, um, kind of this is what you're doing. Um, how do you how do you like that? Is it are you thinking like this isn't what I signed up for? Because you're thinking back to all those books, or are you thinking, oh, this is great, you know, I'm done with all that now. It was, uh, it was interesting because I, I, it was different than what I expected. So I expected, and, and probably wrongfully so, I expected it to be more like the Vietnam book Rangers, you know, okay. I expected it to be more like, Hey, it's three or four dudes creeping around, blow up a bridge, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't, I didn't realize that having privates is like, the ranger regiment's biggest strength and weakness you know in terms of you're, you're always to the lowest common denominator which is the the youngest ranger private that you have is your you're as strong as you could ever be right so um i didn't really understand that going into it so i think i had a a, a misleading connotation of what that was going to you know a perception of what that was going to be like and it wasn't the way that I thought it was going to be, but nothing in my career was what I thought it was going to be. So that maybe that's a, a whole separate topic, but right. uh, 
anyway, I, I expected the Rangers to be more like the Vietnam stuff that I read, right or wrong. And so after I, I made it through Ranger school is when I started hearing about this more specialized unit within the Rangers that gets to do scuba stuff and gets to do military free fall. And it sounded a lot more like uh, the Vietnam book stuff that I read. And so that became kind of my next target of opportunity. You know, what can I do that's different? So right before um, we ended up going on the joint readiness exercise in Texas from when that's from where we like launched to go to Mogadishu mm -hmm. um, before going on the, on the training exercise, I had told my chain of command that, Hey, I want to go to this regimental reconnaissance detachment selection in the fall, which was in October of 93. And that was kind of like, okay, we get it. Um, they didn't hold that against me or anything like that. Right. And then, when I got back from ranger school, then they started sending me to uh, like jump master school and things like that. So, you know, once, once you make it through that kind of initial pipeline, uh, they're grooming you to be a leader. They're, they're grooming you so that you can take on more responsibility so that you can be a jump master so that you can, you know, do all those kinds of things. So I think right. there's a handful of schools and things like that. And, uh, and anyway, was, was ready to kind of check out the next thing. And this wasn't, you know, it wasn't a wartime army. It wasn't, there was nothing going on. So uh, the chances of deploying from one versus the other, you know, it, it was all, nobody ever thought that way. It was just, you know, career, career progression. Right. And so you go on this exercise, but then Mogadishu starts happening. You guys get brief that, hey, um, they're stealing aid, uh, killing people. There's some warlords over there. So you go back to Benning uh, train with a couple of Delta guys for a while, correct? And then no, we, everything kind of stands down. No, we went. So we we went to this joint readiness exercise in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Okay. And that that started in like July of '93, and it was maybe like a two week long, two or three week long, um, kind of once a year training exercise where like all of the units of JSOC get together and okay and do missions together so that, you know, if we have to go do this thing for real, like we know how to talk to one another and we know how to support one another and that kind okay. of thing. So that's, that's what the, the training exercise was. Okay. So from there, we, we basically got told, you know, Hey, you're going to go do this thing. We're going to go train up. Um, and it, it went back and forth a few times. And we ended up at Fort Bragg uh, at the compound at the unit compound doing okay. a training there. So we did it about a 10 day train up. It may have been a week. I, I don't remember the exact number of days. Uh, and then we went back to Texas. They were like, Hey, it's not going to happen yet. Um, you know, the president isn't ready to launch this task force yet. So go back and participate in the training exercise. And we got back there, uh, the day that we got back, literally the day, the hour that we got back, they had already made a decision that we're going to launch the task force. So we got told not to get off the plane, uh, you know, sleep, go ahead and rest for a few hours. We're going to do a crew swap and fuel the plane. And then you're going back to Bragg. And that's, that's what happened. So we went back to Bragg. We were there for a couple of days. And then we went from there from Pope Air Force Base over to uh, Mogadishu. So when you, when you go to Bragg this first time and you train up with the, the Delta guys, wh what's your first impression of seeing? Cause this was the first time that you'd actually seen them, right? No. So I went to Ranger school with, uh, uh, this is my safety. Oh, really? Yeah. I went to ranger school with him and, and one other guy, Brad Holling, uh, who lost his leg on October 3rd. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those two guys were in, we were in the same company together. And, oh, wow. And it was kind of like, they don't know the SF guys cause there were special forces guys in ranger school. Okay. Uh, they don't really know each other and they don't really hang with them. Uh, but they befriended a handful of us rangers and you could just tell like these were different cats. They were, you know, there was something different about them. And it, I didn't piece it together until, uh, you know, maybe one of them said something about it. And, you know, we had a conversation about what unit they were from and, and uh, you know, oh, combat applications group. Like, oh, OK. I know what well, if, if I remember in reading, 
as they were coming down to pick you guys up, like in the team van, that was the first guys you saw, right? Yeah. Yeah. When so, you got there. Yeah. So, so that makes it a little easier. Yeah. It was, it was kind of cool. So we, we landed, we actually fast roped. Uh, we flew in Blackhawks from uh, a, a base that was further out in the woods in Fort Benning or Fort Bragg. And uh, we got on helicopters and we flew to the compound and we fast roped into this one field on the compound and the helicopters land and they spin down and the team vans roll up. And the first guy I see was Norm who I had been to ranger school with and right. he gets out and flips his blonde <laughs> hair back. And, and, <laughs> like you jealous, <laughs> like long blonde surfer hair. And uh, anyway, he's the first guy that I see. So I was like, ah, it's kind of cool because I know some of these guys. Right. And, uh, and that, that helps to some degree, you know, that kind of comes into the story later. So you get on the planes, you guys fly to Mogadishu. Um, now I, I want to talk about something that I thought was interesting in, um, some interviews that you have done prior, uh, where you talked about that, um, you wish, uh, more things were spoken about, not just, uh, what everyone knows is Black Hawk down, but about the missions that were done before that. Um, that were very successful where um, I think you teamed up with a couple Delta guys and did some stuff, you and a, a couple other Rangers teamed up. Um, so I want to talk about those before we get into that. Can you, can you speak to those? Yeah, there were, there were, I think, and I can never remember. I, I, I don't Google it, but there were either seven or eight missions that we did while we were in Mogadishu and the Black Hawk down event was the last one. So uh, that's, that's the one that's been glorified. That's the one that's gotten all the attention, but there were uh, either six, I think there were seven total missions. Um, you know, so there were six other operations that happened while we were there and no, nobody even really knows what they were or who they captured or, and I don't remember all of those things. Of course uh, not. Either, but you know, we were, the point being is there was more to the story than just what happened on October 3rd and 4th. And I feel like that's, you know, there were some pretty significant gunfights. There were some, uh, you know, the biggest thing I think I was talking about recently was just how going out into the city could kind of feel the tension building from one to the next. And uh, the use of helicopters to come in and kind of uh, blow off the crowd and, and push back the crowd and things like that. And it was it was escalating. But that whole point being that like our mind frame going into uh, October 3rd and 4th wasn't, you know, nobody, nobody said, Hey, you guys are going to a bad part of the city. I never heard that. Nobody on my vehicle, you know, nobody that I was with ever heard any of that. I don't think anybody knew it to be any different than any of the other operations that we did. I don't think that we thought that any part of the city was safer than another part. Um, you know, we certainly didn't know that if that was the case. So to us, um, you know, going into October 3rd and 4th was the same as every other mission. And, you know, it's, it's dangerous. It's, it's hostile. It's not what I would describe as a war zone. It was kind of like a maybe semi-permissive place, you know, like not like getting rolled up by ISIS and getting beheaded because you're an American. Like I didn't feel like that was the type of, uh, environment that Mogadishu was. It definitely wasn't friendly, uh, but it wasn't a war zone. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, Hey, you're clear to just fire at whomever. Right. It's an invasion or something, you know, it's, it's a totally different thing. So, um, anyway, a lot of that stuff just has been glossed over and never really talked about, but there were some pretty cool things that happened. And I, I think it kind of leads though with, with those, uh, missions, that are being done before actual the the seventh mission. I don't you feel that that kind of set the tone for it. Um, they had been successful. I think that as you're successful in the missions that we're doing, you get a I don't want to say more bravado and stuff over there, but you get a little more um, clear on 
what your mission, what your objective is going to be. You kind of start seeing these missions like, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened. This is what we're moving towards. Did you feel that with these missions building up to that seventh one? Like, okay, we're, we're kind of in our groove now. We know what we're doing. We know why we're here. Um, or did you, did you ever think that over there? No, it, it was all following a very logical progression. And, uh, you know, again, it's like the tension, the tension was the only part of that that was kind of different than everything else. Um, you know, we never really had clear guidance on much of anything that we did over there. It was, it was very uh, reactive, you know, and the normal mission uh, profile that the Rangers would do at the time is like, hey, we're going to give a two hour operations order and brief everybody on exactly what everybody's doing. You know, that was kind of typical for what the ranger regiment did back in those days so for us to be told hey we're going and doing this thing and you're going to go here and he's going to go there and that's it it was pretty you know pretty uh, insufficient in terms of 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 the information that we could have used mm -hmm. um, anyway so we adjusted to that and we got used to hey i'm kind of going out and doing the same thing each time it's just in a different place and so i'm just adjusting uh, what I'm doing, where the target building is in relation to where I am on the ground. That was really the only, you know, pertinent information that we needed. Everything else was, was kind of an SOP. Okay. So you're, you're there, you guys are living in a big hangar. And I guess when you get there, the, the hangar is not even secure. Like there's people from all over just walking around where you guys are going to be. Yeah. Uh, so you guys have to secure the hangar, secure your sites, all that kind of stuff. Um, it seems to me in everything that I've read and stuff that I don't want to say chaos, but it, it definitely was not uh, organized when you guys got there. Like, I think that the hangar itself, like that stuff was, it was secure in that, um, you know, the people living there and the people living around it weren't, weren't, you know, bad guys, bad, bad guys. Right. So right. it wasn't like you had that, that intermingling with you, but, uh, it wasn't like it wasn't taken care of the way that you know I think a, a ranger line company would would look at securing an area you know so until we could figure out everything that was going on we just kind of fell back on what came naturally which was okay let's set up a perimeter and make sure that nobody comes in this perimeter I mean, <laughs> right you know, prior prior to that there weren't like we had a a kind of a, a gate that led into, you know, where vehicles would drive into the hangar, uh, the hangar area and the jock building and everything else that you see. And like a lot of the pictures from, from, uh, from that area, but everything else was kind of wide open. And so, you know, that was the only thing that we could really do is, Hey, let's secure it and make sure that nobody can come in or out. And then we'll figure out what needs to happen from there. So, so you do all these things, we get up to the seventh mission. Can you kind of set the scene and then let's walk through it. I know that we can't spend an entire time on it, um, but can we walk through what happens in that uh, about 18 hours that you're on the ground? Uh, we'll do like a two minute. Yeah. Like, uh, let, yeah, let's, uh, yeah. But you're on the ground for like 18 hours, but can you kind of set up before? And the reason I want you to do this is because a lot of times on this show, we, we talk about mind state and stuff. So when I talk to some um, cops in Dallas that helped take down a terrorist, um, what their mind state was going into it, what their mind state was in the middle of it and what their mind state was at the end of it. So kind of setting up and going into the mission. Can we do that? Then go through the mission, things that are happening to you, not only physically, but psychologically through it and then kind of move through the battle. Sure. Yeah. And it, it actually was a pretty quick progression of emotions and everything else. But okay. um, initially, you know, again, there, there was no preparation for like, Hey, this is going to be a rough one guys, or, you know, Hey, we're going to a really bad area. So, you know, keep your head on a swivel. There, right. there was none of that. It was just like every other operation we're driving out. And um, the thing that, the thing that like, I didn't really understand or realize things until they were happening. And then you start to realize like, Oh, uh, I don't have a radio, so I don't really know what's going on. And, but that didn't become apparent 
until we were in that situation, you know? So uh, back then we didn't all have radios. We had a radio in our vehicle and that was, that was it. And unless you were sitting right there in the vehicle, you couldn't hear what was happening on the radio or kind of what was going on or the bigger picture. Um, and even then, once, once the gunfire picked up and everything else, you couldn't hear the radio at all. So it didn't really matter if you were in the vehicle sitting right next to the radio, you didn't hear what was, nobody could hear what was happening. So, so could I, I, I want to just jump in here real quick from something that you had said before. I, I, I had heard you talk about uh, going on this and, and since you mentioned the vehicles, I want to kind of bring it up. You were talking about that um, you guys train for bread and butter missions. Like this is what we do. This is the things we do. Um, and, and it was different over there. Like you were going on missions that you guys hadn't necessarily trained for and they kind of had the forces all split around. So does that change anything going into this? Because uh, like I said, you brought up the vehicle. So I want to know if this changes anything on the ground. It was just something. So, so if you think about where I was, like we were an assault platoon, we were a jump clearing platoon. So we never messed with vehicles in any way shape or form so okay. so i didn't get to do that as a private and i certainly didn't get to do that as a specialist you know with the ranger tab that has a couple of young privates underneath of him um you know that was something that was completely out of our lexicon so uh something happened and and again probably covered in in some better detail on, on another thing that i did recently but we we had trained up and the whole train up prior to going was spent on the helicopter package. And we were a part of that. And then in the gap um, of going back to Texas, going back to Bragg and then going over to Mogadishu, that changed. And we got pushed to the vehicle package. And so again, it was something that we had never done. Our privates had never driven these vehicles. We weren't used to the heavy uh, guns that were on the vehicles or even really know how to operate those until um, we got other guys to come that were more familiar with those weapons. Um, you know, so it was just kind of, the whole thing was kind of fly by the seat of your pants. Um, hey, you're going to do this now. I know you practice this and that's something that your platoon has never done, but we're going to give you this mission anyway and go do it. And so we only had a few days to kind of prepare uh, once we got to Mogadishu, we only had a couple of days to kind of prepare before we were going and doing the first thing. And uh, I, I think, you know, to this day, that was probably a bad call. I don't know how it would have changed the battle, if it would have changed the battle for the better or for the worse. I, I have no idea. But just in the familiarity of uh, all of our leaders and what we would normally typically do, if doing that type of mission, it was completely out of, you know, our, our normal lexicon of things that we did. Um, so yeah, that, that didn't help. Did you say that, uh, if you would have had a, a gunship or, or something in the air that it would have changed the battle completely, you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, so that, that's, that's like bigger picture stuff where I can understand why the president at the time might have felt like, hey, I don't want to have this huge, uh, you know, I don't want to have all this air platforms flying right. around and dropping bombs in the city and things like that. Like, I get that. Uh, and so I understand why. Um, we still should have had something there for a, a just in case, you know, and if, if something goes significantly wrong, um, you know, we, we need to be able to adjust and extract ourselves and things like that. So there, there were a lot of things that we requested and wanted to have, but got denied. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to throw blame or throw shade at the president at the time because he didn't want it to be this high profile thing. He wanted it to be a very under wraps, slide in, get rid of these guys, capture, you know, all the dudes that you're supposed to capture and come home. And that, that was really it. So. So, uh, you, you guys load up, you go in. So we've kind of talked about everything. Um, as we go in mind state, as you're going into this. So just like every other thing, um, it was a Sunday and 
it was supposed to be a day off, which, you know, we didn't, obviously you can't plan for when intelligence right. hits and you know, when somebody comes, but generally speaking, we didn't do stuff on Sundays. Um, and that would be, we could be resupplying, we could be doing anything, administrative tasks or whatever. It was kind of like Sunday was just your day to do whatever. You don't have to do squad events and PT and all of that stuff. So it was kind of like a down day. Um, and so the fact that we were doing something was kind of bizarre anyway, because typically, you know, that wasn't something we would do. Um, so my friend going in, was it was the same as everything else. It was just, you know, head on a swivel. Uh, things have been escalating. We've been seeing a little more sporadic gunfire and maybe an RPG fired here or there or a mortar round get launched at us, you know, here and there kind of thing. Um, the daylight stuff that we did, you know, sometimes we had crowds that were converging and thousands of people, you know, kind of right in and around us. And so keeping them at bay and everything else. And, and uh, really that was it. And, and, it wasn't until um, we, we started, you know, engaging people and being engaged that I think things kind of switched. And so the first time, as an example, the first time that I got out of the vehicle that I was riding in, uh, I thought we were, oh, we're here. You know, we're at the Target building. And really, we weren't. We were still kind of fighting our way to the objective. And I didn't even know that because of the thing I mentioned before, which is we don't have communications. Right. Uh, one dude can't run around and disseminate information to everybody. And right. then he's got to run to another vehicle to talk to the platoon sergeant that's telling all the squad leaders what to do. And then they go disseminate it to all the, like, like it was just, that was bad. You know, that was, that was something that we should have figured out a better way to do that. Uh, but anyway, the point being is like, I didn't have that information or know that we're not even at the target building. So we were starting to engage people and things were starting to step up. And, and the first thing that, that kind of stood out to me was I wasn't hearing the report of the gunfire. I was hearing the cracks of the bullet and I didn't understand that I, what I was hearing was the bullets cracking. I was thinking that I was hearing the report of the weapon. So we had no hearing protection. It wasn't like, you know, people running That's around with doors and comms and SA and all kinds of stuff going on. Like there was nothing. Um, and, and so for me, it was just a very confusing, like, man, what kind of guns are those? And I, I, I yelled at one of my buddies who was killed shortly thereafter. And I remember yelling at him like, what, what the heck are they shooting at us? 22s? Because it just sounded like these little pops. And, uh, and it wasn't until I saw pieces of the sidewalk in the wall around me that I was like, ah, and it didn't take long. You know, it was maybe 10, 15 seconds for me to piece right. it together. And then I realized, like, I need to seek cover and then return fire and all the things that kind of come naturally, um, you know, to an infantry or light infantry guy that's, that's taking fire. So that was, that was kind of the initial thing. And, and really for me, um, then psychologically, it was, it was, it became fear. It was really this overwhelming, uh, you know, just scared to death. And it didn't keep me from uh, moving around and engaging people. It didn't keep me from, from doing what I was supposed to be doing. It was just, uh, you know, as panicked as you could possibly be. I don't, I, I couldn't explain it any other way. You know, it was just, total chaos and, and just being scared to death. Well, um, you know, in speaking of that, because people hear that and, and that's why I try and talk about the psychological aspect on the show. People hear that and they, they think a ranger is like, has all that fear and stuff. Yeah. It's a natural driver. It makes your brain kick into gear and figure out what you need to do. I would be worried if that fear wasn't there. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that the average uh, John Q citizen understands that when they hear stuff, they think that these guys are, and we've talked about it with police officers and stuff like that. They think these guys are just robots that just go in there and, and you know, they, they know what they're supposed to do and they get done and they leave and they don't understand that all during the process before, during, and after there's a psychological effect that's going on. And it's, it's great to hear 
that 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 fear is there, that it shows that everyone is human that's going in there. So as this is going on, do you know that anything has been shot down yet or anything? Or are you just engaging that, in the... That hadn't happened yet. Okay. So so technically, yeah, I, I didn't know, but I wouldn't have known anyway, even if it oh, happened. Right, because of the radio. Right. So, so it was just kind of like running around engaging dudes. Uh, I ended up... I ended up... Uh, in an alleyway with a, with a Delta guy. And he and I were kind of yelling at one another and shooting. And about that time I saw one of the Ranger vehicles get hit with an RPG. And I saw some of the guys get hurt. And uh, at the same time, my vehicle, the vehicle that I was in kind of started driving down the street. And all I could think was like, oh, I got to catch back up with my vehicle. And so I made, made my way down the street, maybe a couple hundred yards by myself. <laughs> and, and that, um, I think something kind of like overtakes your, your body when you're in that situation. And like, I don't remember much about it. Uh, when I met back up with my vehicle, they were still moving down the street. And I think that's when I realized like, Oh, we're, we're trying to go somewhere, trying to do something, but nobody was like, we don't have time. And there's, there is shit flying everywhere. All right. RPGs flying down the street, all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, like, we don't have time to talk about what we're doing. We're just, I know that we're doing something, we're moving. And so we, we started using our vehicle as kind of like a cover. Uh, as gunfire was coming from one side, we were on this side of the vehicle trying to use it as cover to cross over street to street to street. And and then we got to a place and we started loading people uh, into one of the vehicles. And there, there was were some, uh, some of my friends, or one of the guys that had been killed, uh, we loaded him into a vehicle and then ultimately ended up uh, starting to drive back to the hangar to exfil those guys. And I think, I think that I knew that we were going back to the hangar, that, that, but that's all that I knew that we were doing. I didn't, know that um anyway that that kind of starts like the whole next chapter of adrenaline and everything else that was going on so let me ask you real quick before we get into that um what do you think made this and, and even if you do know what do you think made this mission different than all the other ones you said rpgs are coming down the street you said that you had met resistance sporadic gunfire in in missions before what made this one so different where it was like kicking a fire ant mound. So uh, we didn't know this at the time, but we found out later, and it, and this is the real answer. There were uh, 300, 300 Al-Qaeda fighters from Kenya had been delivered to Mogadishu via bus that morning. Oh, wow. And so come to find out, like that was really America's first engagement with Al-Qaeda. Um, we didn't know that other than they were like, uh, Kenyan, somebody said something, we, we found that out after the fact. So I think that, I think that those guys were there and probably started, you know, the initial wave of, uh, you know, kind of defense and, uh, and coming after us. And then it, it just erupted from there, you know? I'm like, hey, what's going on? Let me grab my RPG and go over there and see what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I just fire saw Joe RPG. fire an RPG. Let me get rid of mine. This thing's been hanging out here for a long time. So you, we move into this second phase of it. Um, so how does our mind state change? What are we pushing forward? You know you're about to head back to uh, – you. now, you didn't know you were going to just drop those uh, X-Fill or anything like that. You just knew that you were headed back to the hangar, correct? Yeah, just knew that we were heading back to the hangar and that – that's really where the craziness started. Um, yeah, it was just one ambush after another, you know, kind of set up by uh, things that were in the street. So like once, once they had us in the city, then they started kind of like roadblocking us in there. And we didn't, we didn't know that, but as we were trying to drive around, it was just, you know, you'd make a turn and, there was a crowd of people and burning tires in the street and everybody had guns and was shooting. And it was kind of that for, I think it took us 
you know, probably the better part of 30 or 45 minutes to get back to the hangar. And uh, every, every part of that, like, I don't think I ever really stopped engaging people that whole time. And during that drive, uh, I saw, uh, you know, my best friend at the time get killed. And, you know, from, so you want to talk about psychologically, uh, I went from, you know, fear, scared to death, um, feeling like, you know, this is going really badly to angry. And as soon as I saw him killed, that, that kind of switched things to the next, you know, to the next phase, which was just anger. And, and uh, anger is probably an understatement. Okay, so so can we talk about that a little bit? Anger and understatement, because the way I hear you saying it is it's anger, but it's a controlled, um, very uh, pointed spear kind of emotion for you. It, people think of anger just where you just, you know, uh, don't have any control. But as I talk to you, I see that it turns into almost like a, another weapon to use. Yeah, definitely so. Um, yeah, and I, I don't really know, you know, thinking back on it, I don't really know how I felt other than, you know, all right, we're playing for keeps. Like, this is, this is a real thing now. It's not just some guys shooting at us, like, a little closer than they've ever done before. And, you know, maybe a couple of guys get nicked up here and there. Uh, this, this is for real now. And that that was kind of the switch that I guess was needed, you know, unfortunately to kind of, you know, psychologically prepare for like, this is, this is, you know, this is really bad. This isn't just go out do something and come back and everybody's high five in and, you know, right. like people aren't going home, you know? Right. And this is the very first of probably many more to come. It was, it was that apparent, you know? And so where are we at time frame right now? Um, probably four in the afternoon. Okay. So you yeah. were saying you went out at three, right? Yeah, it was probably something like that. And I don't know that, you know, I, I, I haven't memorized the book and I think the book was probably pretty accurate in the timelines of things. Because right. They, so I you think, think that, but, but about an hour into it. Yeah, it's probably, we're probably at an hour into it at that point. Okay, so you get back to, uh, it takes you 35, 45 minutes. Uh, you get back to the airport. What goes on there? So uh, at that point, again, because of no communications, um, in my mind, the mission was over. We had, we had done this thing. We'd gone out. It was totally chaotic. I think that I was near the Target building. I remember seeing the Olympic Hotel at some point. Uh, I drove somewhere else. Uh, I grab, you know, help grab some dead people and put them in the back of a vehicle. And, you know, we drive through one ambush after another. I don't, I'm at that point, I'm still kind of guessing like, or going back to the hangar. I think we're going back to the hangar. Um, and we get to the hangar and it's like, whoa, mission, mission over. And so emotionally, uh, I think we had to lock and clear our weapons. We came in, I remember coming in through the gate. And there were some guys that were killed in action and they, they took those vehicles and they drove somewhere else. And there were a group of Rangers and I think everybody that hadn't gone on the mission were all there kind of like there to greet us. And I got out of my vehicle and threw my stuff down. And I think I started kicking and punching everything that I could see <laughs> in sight. I was in like infuriated um, for, I'm not even sure I know all the reasons why, just very frustrated at the whole thing. You know, like this obviously didn't go the way we wanted it to go. Right. Um, and, you know, I know two of my friends, uh, there were four of us that were at the beach that morning because it was supposed to be a day off. And of the four of us, two of them are dead. I know that. And, uh, you know, that was kind of it. So, I'm, I'm in a rage at that point. I had a couple of the Rangers that didn't go out on the initial assault, uh, come up and try and like hug me and contend. I just remember pushing dudes off. And there was another buddy of mine, 
um, who was who was with me that whole time. Uh, and I remember looking over and he was just, you know, teary eyed, smoking a cigarette. And I, that was kind of the, the next thing that I remember was like, oh man, let me, let me check on dude. And we started talking and there was like an audience around us almost because these dudes didn't know what had happened. They didn't, you know, they were trying to get information and figure out what was going on. And it was like, man, what the fuck? I just remember looking at each other and like, what, what the hell was that? Like, you know, what is, what is going on? What is this? You know? And it was just very confusing, very angering, not knowing what was up. Uh, you know, all of that kind of like culminated into this one moment, you know? So has the, we talked about the initial fear, has it kind of worn off now? It's, it's been for a while. So has it worn off now that the, these other emotions have kicked in or is it, is it still kind of there in the back of your mind fucking with you a little bit, but you know, like, well, you thought this was over, right? Yeah. So in my, I, I felt like I let my guard down at that point. And I wouldn't say like the, the fear was gone. I wasn't, I wasn't scared at that point. I was okay. in a fit of rage. Right. And, and it was more uh, frustrated and angry at the situation. And now, now it's like all those things, Right. All those things that we talked about that would have been useful and helpful that you really don't know. Right. Until you're in that situation. And it's like, I don't know what's going on. There's no communication. There's no dissemination of information. Um, I'm just out there flapping, running around, shooting people. Literally. Um, we don't have any of the things that we could have used overhead that would have helped us in this situation. Like all that stuff kind of comes to a head and it's, now it's very, it's very apparent and obvious that uh, we're in this situation and it's not good. And really, there's not any way out of this situation. So that's, that's kind of like everything in the mind frame and everything else. And that's about the time when, hey, uh, Blackhawk got shot down. We need to go back into the city. And my reaction to that was never out of fear. It's depicted in the book and it's depicted in the movie. Uh, and they combined me with another character who is asthmatic. Um, and anyway, I was, I was angry that we didn't have maybe a better plan for how to go about doing this. It was like, okay, if we just go drive around in the city, like that's not gonna, like you don't know what we just did. We just drove back through this. Like, that's not survivable. And it's not a question of I'm scared to go die or I might get shot. It's like, that's the dumbest option that we could, you know, like, hey, just go back out there and drive around looking for the crash sites. Like, you, know, you don't get it. And this is that stupid. Uh, and so that was kind of my response to the whole thing it was more out of like, this is this is the the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. Like let's let's put together a good plan. Do we need to get helicopters back here. Do we need to get roped into new target areas? Like that's a better option. And I could think of that as a tab spec four. Whereas, you know, like oh, we're just going to get signed up to go drive around through ambushes. That's not a good plan. So, I feel like there could have been a, a collective regrouping very quickly, figure out something that was a little bit smarter and we could have gone and done something and maybe not had more casualties. So, and, and let's go back and forth with the movie for a minute. Do you have that aerial team that is watching kind of the whole thing is, I guess you would say coordinating efforts on the ground. Uh, they show them over and over where they're kind of flying over and telling you turn left, turn right. Do, do you actually have that in the air or is that kind of Hollywood um, doing believe, its thing? I believe so. I didn't know that to be the case at the time. Okay. And so, so I didn't, I didn't even know. So once we, once we end up going back out, uh, we, we basically plussed up on everything. So now we're at the point of like, okay, we're going to go do this thing. We're going to go drive around again. Uh, the one luxury that we had was we're not carrying this. So I can grab as much ammo as I need. I've got water. I've got all that stuff that I need. You know, uh, it was, it was always depicted as like, oh, the guys didn't have everything that they needed. And that was true for some of the guys that were out there. But for us, like 
we had we had tons of ammo, tons of everything that we could have used. So you were almost like a mobile ammo dump yeah, site. That's why, that's why I call it the rolling the rolling ASP ammo supply point. So anyway, um, we plus up because I had some guys on my vehicle that got injured, and on one of our other like our squad vehicles, uh, a guy that was killed. So we we started taking on guys that weren't on, you know, maybe a guy that was hurt and he couldn't make it out on the initial mission, but now he's going to go back out and, and some officers and some other people. So they jump on the vehicles and I'll, I'll never forget. Um, we had our company XO got in the vehicle with me and we're rolling out the gate and he's like, all right, guys, let's, you know, all right, guys, let's make sure we're doing the right thing out there. And, you know, only shoot people with weapons and, you know, keep it focused and that kind of thing. And, uh, we got, we got out of the gate by like maybe 500 yards and we were already getting engaged again. And, and that's kind of the way it went. So we spent the next, uh, we spent the next hour and change driving around. Uh, and I don't even know at this point what we were trying to do because I've never really, I don't really see it depicted in the movie and uh, I didn't read the book and I don't really care to read the book, but we're driving around. I think we were looking for the crash site. I think we were looking for one of the crash sites. Uh, I know that we were just shooting a lot of people. Um, and I, at some point we bump into the other part of the vehicle package that's out there driving around too. And I remember linking up with them and there were there were more people that had been killed uh and there were some vehicles that had been you know disabled to the point that we had to start cross-loading people from different vehicles to other vehicles and uh some of the wounded and some of the killed in action we had to you know cross-load bodies and uh stuff like that and i remember uh destroying vehicles in the middle of the street with like thermite grenades and right. stuff like that and and so I don't know if that happened because it was a plan, you know, or if it was just like, wow, we bumped into one another and out here driving around <laughs> looking for stuff. To this day, I don't know really what we were doing other than uh, I think we were driving around looking for the crash site. I think we were also trying to link up with the other part of the, the vehicle convoy that was out there. So they had, I think, uh, six or eight vehicles in their convoy, and I think we had two, two or maybe three. So. Damn, so how many how many so you got all together that's nine vehicles uh how many boots on the ground do you have in that nine um i'm not sure i know that i know that there were about a hundred and change rangers on the ground in total um so i i want to say it was probably half and half you know it was probably okay. like, it was probably like 50 and 50 ish something like that. And there's probably, you know, somebody has those numbers. I, I just don't remember each vehicle basically had four dudes and a gunner. Okay. And there, there might be an extra guy in the back. There might not be. Um, and I think we may have had 12 vehicles total. I, I could be wrong in that. We may have had 10. I, I don't really remember. I know for my squad, we had two. So if every, if every squad had two vehicles and there are right. four, you know, three squads or whatever. Uh, anyway, it's, so I think it was, you know, something like that, but yeah. So that was basically the remainder of the afternoon into uh, early evening was just kind of driving around and, you know, <laughs> on the fly, on the fly. Like, yeah, it, it just, it, it just sounds, uh, you know, unbelievable that, that you have people in charge. You got guys on the ground telling them like, Hey, this is a horrible idea. We're just, we're not doing anything other than engaging and getting ambushed everywhere. And, and the plan continues to go forward seemingly to me unchanged. Does that, does that sound about right? Yeah, basically. And, it, and it's not like, I'm not faulting the chain of command for anything. Well, of course not. Like, Hey, we just need to go do this. And, and I just feel like with some of the things that we had the ability to do at the time, like we could have probably, uh, you know, assembled groups to throw on helicopters. That way you're not like doing the drive back and forth. 
and, and sustaining more casualties. At the, at the same time, I could look at that and say, you probably wouldn't want to risk a multi, you know, cabillion dollar helicopter uh, just trying to secure a, a burned up helicopter. I, I don't know, but I could, I could see both sides of that. I just, I just feel like there wasn't really any smart plan put together other than, you know, hey, just, just go out and drive around, you know, see if you can find this. And you have two crash sites, right? Yeah. And again, I didn't, I don't think that I even knew there were two at that point. I knew uh, when we first went back out, there was only one Blackhawk that had been shot down. And it, I think while we were out there driving around, I think was when the second one was shot down. Could, could it, you know, something like that. And but I'm guessing that, you didn't hear it again. What's that, that? that wasn't, I'm guessing though, that that didn't get disseminated out again, because if you're in a vehicle with a radio and you don't know that there's a possible second crash site, that's not being disseminated. Yeah, it wasn't really, like, I don't think that any of us had a really clear picture of what was going on until we ended up back at the hangar the second time. And once we got back there, then everybody kind of started, like, some of the wounded were back, and, you know, uh, some of the guys that were that were pretty scuffed up were laying there on stretchers and waiting to get you back to the hospital and things like that. And, you know, so we were talking with some of those guys, and... Uh, I think while the leaders you know, leadership was kind of planning what was going to happen next. And that was, that was when the whole coordination piece of, you know, Hey, let's see if we can get the Pakistanis and the Malaysians, you know, to help out with their armor package and, and everything else. I think that's kind of where that started to happen. Um, but we really didn't know. And it was before dark. So we were back at the hangar the second time. And, and that was kind of when we pieced together, like, Oh no, there was a third helicopter that was shot, but it, it made it to the port and it crash landed there and everybody's okay. Um, you know, and then, then that's kind of when we started hearing more of the story and, and kind of knowing a little bit more of what was going on. So what time are we at right now? You think? Probably seven o'clock at night, something like that. So we're only, we're still only four hours into this. Yeah it's it's unbelievable so uh you i i guess regroup command meets they make the plan is the next plan any better uh so the next plan was let's wait until dark because at least then <laughs> and then drive around yeah at least then we're not in the middle of the day um uh, we drove over to the port area and i i don't remember this part of the drive uh i think we could get most of the way there uh, back roads from the airfield. So if like we, we didn't go out into the city and drive there, I don't believe. But uh, the next thing that I remember was like, we're at the port and we were, all the vehicles were lined up. And um, I don't think that we had any of the armor vehicles with us there, but I think the plan was like, we're all going to converge and meet at this spot. And that was wherever these crash sites were. And so they probably had pinpointed the locations by then and all of that. I don't, I, I can't say that that was necessarily disseminated, you know, to everybody like, Hey, here's exactly, you know, that, that type of thing. But, um, at that point we knew we're going to go back in, we're going to secure these crash sites. Uh, we have darkness, you know, in our favor and, you know, we're going to ex make sure everybody's, you know, extricated from the helicopters and then we'll return home kind of thing. Uh, and that was, that point, um, and I'm not sure exactly what time we rolled back out the gate, but there was still pretty significant fighting happening and gunfire and, and uh, I, I, I don't think at that point that I had fear or a whole lot of anger. It was just kind of like, okay, we gotta we got go do this thing. Uh, there is no other option, There nothing. Right. Nothing is, you know, there is no other way for this to happen. So we're all in this together and, you know, let's go do it. And so, it, so would you almost say you were emotionless at that point? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say emotionless. You know, I think, I think I still had a lot of the, the same things going on psychologically, but mm -hmm. I didn't feel them the same way. Maybe. Um, okay. I don't remember being afraid, you know, I don't remember at that point. I don't remember. Uh, and I don't remember being, you know, 
fired up angry or anything like that. It was just kind of more mm-hmm. like uh, resigned to the fact that like, if this is going to happen, this is going to happen. We got to go do this thing. And, you know, there's really no other if, ands, or buts about it. Like, we just have to go do this. So let's go do it, you know. Um, and we went out and, and basically, you know, parked right near the crash sites while while dudes were getting extricated. And that took, uh, you know, the whole night. So the the at that point in the battle, um, you know, by the time we got there and by the time we were just waiting for dudes to literally be cut out of the helicopter kind of thing. Um, the firing had pretty much died down and it, it had calmed down, you know, pretty significantly. So probably by midnight, there wasn't a whole lot of action. And now it was just us getting updates. We could hear the radio. Uh, yeah, they're working on such and such, you know, they should be about another hour. And everybody was just kind of chill there. Nobody was panicked. There wasn't anything, big going on. It wasn't until, uh, you could start to kind of get a little glimpse of sunlight, uh, in the morning that people started, you know, like, Hey, how close are we going to get done with this soon? Uh, We probably want to be out of here, you know, before the sun comes back up. And, and so that started to kind of happen. And, uh, as soon as the sun was up, it was like game on all over again. And, so there was there was a good you know probably six hours of lull in in fire and just sporadic stuff here and there, um, you know. But you you know you say a lull, but not really. I mean, yes, you're not actively engaging targets all the time, but your head's on a swivel. You're still, you know, you're still in that environment. So yeah, the body's yeah. not shutting off. You're not getting rest by any means, uh, mentally, physically, anything like that. So you tell, you know, I, I guess, uh, we had had pilots taken captive by now then, right? Yeah. And we didn't know that obviously then. Um, and, and that's, that's even like kind of into the next phase of the battle. Um, you know, so the sun comes up and the fighting starts again. And now we know, all right, we, we've got everybody that we've got. We're, we're exfilling. We're going back, you know, to wherever. I don't know if I knew exactly where we were going, but we ended up um, kind of fighting our way to the stadium. And I'm, I don't know which stadium that was, but uh, I've got pictures of it. And I posted some of the pictures of the stadium that are from a couple of years ago, actually. Uh, that some friends of mine that were there sent me. Um, but we ended up at that stadium and there was, there was some pretty significant gunfighting going on, you know, that morning on, on the way out. Um, and then when we got there, you know, we kind of did the cross loading and, you know, helicopters were coming in and taking the dead guys out and taking the, the wounded were all kind of like in one area on stretchers and things like that. And so they were, we were talking to those guys before because we knew they were headed to Germany after they got, you know, stitched up and, uh, and put on a plane. So we were trying to talk with those guys just to check everybody and, you know, see what their spirits were like and things like that. But yeah. So as, as we move down, um, the, the, I guess you would say the run out of Mogadi, you know, the, the, what I'm talking about trying to get out, um, how does that affect everyone? Cause that's just, we're just trying to get out of here now. Like we're, you, you know what I mean? Like yeah, you've got to be exhausted. Uh, we, we got to get out of here now. Yeah. I, re- I remember at some point, um, at some point there were vehicles from the 10th mountain that, that rolled up in front of us. And it was like basically rolled into our fields of fire. And I remember the guys in the back of the, the 10th mountain guys in the back of the vehicle were, were basically just like, they had their, their weapons pointed up like this and were just like this, just, just sitting there. And at some point there was a, an officer, a major that was running around in the street. And I remember, I remember having to push this guy down out of the way so that we could engage people as he was running around doing whatever he was doing. I don't, I don't know what he was doing, but it was just kind of a, 
it was one of those officer things, like, officer yeah. things. He was uh, yeah. <laughs> making sure. Yeah. Make sure the first surgeon has coffee. So right. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. But, hey, but, yeah. So, so you push this guy out of the way to actively engage. I guess these people that are arriving, they still have no concept of how bad this has been all night because that seems to be the overarching story of this entire night. Like, unless you were in the middle of it, no one seems to understand like this. You have no idea. Like I can't even explain it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Because everyone that keeps showing up is like, well, you know, I mean, let me hunker down right here and point my rifle into the air. And, and they were doing this too. This is the other thing they were doing. You know, the, the sign for, there's a bad guy is like the hand and arm signal is this, right? And so they were they were like this. And they were they were going like that. No joke. You were like, yeah, like, yeah, we've been here. We're we're aware where they're at. <laughs> yeah, and we're like literally firing three or four feet over the top of them. You know, oh my god. That's happening. So anyway, that that goes on and uh, we end up back at the stadium and the stadium was kind of like, all right. It's over. I think we all felt the sense that, you know, that chapter is over and that battle, uh, that mission is over at that point. Um, we're, we're not combat effective, hardly, uh, just because of the number of dudes that were wounded. So out of the hundred and, you know, plus uh, rangers that were on the ground, there were like 77 Purple Hearts. And that doesn't, wow. that doesn't mean that every one of those guys was significantly injured, but there were a large number, you know, probably 30, 40 guys that were pretty significantly injured enough that they couldn't go continue to fight. That's a third um, of your force. So, yeah. So we were at the point where we're kind of like, okay, we're not combat effective. Uh, the wounded and the dead are being, you know, taken care of and exfilled and people are being sent to the hospital and everything else. So we hang out there at the stadium for a while while all that's happening. And then, uh, and then once everybody's gone, we have to now drive all the vehicles back to the hangar. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, part three. Um, and, <laughs> you and you I, guys good? Okay, just take these vehicles back and fuel it, them up it, for us. It's like just minimum force required, uh, you know. That, right. You know, we'll, we'll crossload all these other guys onto helicopters that get flown out. But anyway, so we end up, um, I think at about, Two in the afternoon, we end up back at the hangar for good now. And uh, the drive from the stadium back to the hangar was, was fine. I don't remember anything other than, you know, maybe some hairy situations or something that we thought might escalate. But it was a pretty uh, insignificant. And I think we drove like way the hell out. I think it took us about an hour and a half. We drove like way out to the coast and like up to, you know, something like that. We weren't, we weren't like driving right through the heart of the city. Um, but anyway, by the time we got back there, uh, it wasn't but a few minutes, maybe 30 minutes. I don't remember exactly the amount of time. Uh, in the corner, back corner of the hangar, we had like a, a media room and it was, you know, they had TVs and they had, you know, whatever VHS tapes back then. And, they had a, a cable feed. So um, I remember taking my stuff off and, you know, we were all kind of just figuring shit out and everybody started running back to the back corner of the hangar. And so obviously we go run over there to see what's going on. And it's, it's live CNN coverage. Uh, and they're showing dude getting drugged through the streets. And we didn't, we didn't have the first clue that that was even a thing. Like, I, I don't think any of us knew, like we hadn't gotten to the point of, you know, do you have all your people? Do you have all, you know, are we missing anybody who didn't get recovered off of the air crew who, you know, what, what guys are still out there floating? You know, I don't think we had done that as a task force. Uh, in its entirety, you know, maybe the, the Rangers knew who they had and who they didn't. Maybe. I don't know. But that was my first uh, and our for everybody that was in the hangar. That was the first inkling was that, hey, we, we didn't get everybody. You know, not everybody was recovered. And then within a couple of hours, uh, Mike Durant pops up on TV. And so we didn't, again, like, I don't, I don't think that we knew like, Hey, we're missing a pilot. 
you know, right. Like, hey, there's, you know, there, there's an air whole air crew that's missing. And I, I don't think that anybody knew that. And I don't, um, yeah, nobody, nobody knew that. So there was all of us that were there basically were like, I guess we're going back out. Right. You know, and because of the significance of the battle, I'm, I'm sure that president Clinton was well aware of what was going on, uh, as of probably the day before. Um, but the word that we got was that the UN ambassador to Somalia, who I think was Robert Oakes, if I remember the, or Robert Oakley, um, I remember the name Oakley, and I, I'm pretty sure that's who it was. Um, he was en route and was going to negotiate for the release of Durant and also for the bodies and any body parts and things like that that hadn't been recovered. So we were basically stand down. Uh, we're going to do 24 hours of no operations at all to allow them to do what they say that was negotiated for, which was turning over, uh, you know, turning over anybody that was American. And anyway, I think by the next day, I don't, I don't really remember in terms of that. I, I remember just not being able to eat, um, not being able to sleep, just the wheels in my head wouldn't, you know, turn off. And I, I couldn't do anything to like comfort myself. I couldn't smoke enough cigarettes. I couldn't take enough showers. I couldn't, you know, talk to my friends and things like that. We were all just kind of really, uh, it was, it was a pretty significant moment, you know? And so with all that, I, I guess my question would be, cause you say your wheels are turning. So what's going through your mind? Like, what are you thinking about that's keeping those wheels turning? I don't, I don't even know. I, like, I don't remember now what I was thinking about. Um, I think it was probably more like what's next, you know, what are we, what are we doing next? And, um, you know, where do we go from here? Like in my mind, like, okay, where are the, where are the AC 130 gunships, like they better be in route. And why don't we just bring an entire Ranger battalion here and get online and clear the streets, you know, like we could do that. Um, I think that's kind of everybody's head was at that, at that place where, uh, you know, we don't know what's coming next or what we're going to do. Are we still here doing the mission? Or, like, are we going home? Uh, you know, are more people coming? That kind of thing. And, and I don't, to be honest, I really don't remember other than I remember just having a really hard time sleeping and even eating and just normal stuff. Um, and I think everybody was kind of in the same boat. You know, there was a lot of, it was a pretty emotional time. You know, a lot of our friends were no longer there. And, uh, and even dudes that got hurt just, you know, kind of reliving everything. There was a lot of talking to try and figure out, like, this is now we're, we're together for the first time. So guys that were on the helicopters, like, we can all talk. And, you know, hey, what happened here? And what were you guys doing? And did you hear so-and-so did this? And, you know, that kind of stuff was going on. So, um, you know, yeah, it was just... It, trying to figure stuff out. So within, within, uh, I think 48 hours of, uh, being back at the hangar, we were now training, uh, doing this training thing to go rescue Durant. And so we, we got together with the Pakistanis and the Malaysians. And basically there was, um, unit guys and like a ranger was in charge of, the one of the APCs. So I, it's like me in charge of an APC with uh, a Malaysian gunner and a Malaysian driver. And that's, that's the plan. And then there's, there's some unit guys that are going to ride in the back uh, to go do this rescue mission. And so and I'm sure everyone speaks Malaysian in the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's kind of like drive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that, that was kind of the plan. We, we did rehearsals and we conducted a couple of, you know, practice missions and stuff like that. And, and I think we were all like, I, I really wish that we had been able to go do that. Um, because I think psychologically it would have, it would have been a win, you know, even if it had gone sideways, it, it would have been, it would have been a win to go back and do this thing and not, 
not like the last thing that you ever do in the military is this battle that you didn't really get to finish and you didn't get to finish it the right way and you didn't have the right tools to accomplish the mission the right way and all of that. And uh, anyway, I, I wish that we'd been able to go do that. And I, I think it would have, I think it would have helped a lot of people kind of with closure on the whole event. And, and so that, that was my next question. Do you think a lot of people agree with you in that, that, that were there, that statement that it would have been at least a mental win? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, it's very hard for me to speak to the guys that got right. out sooner after and like what they dealt with. Um, I know for me personally, like my, my next deployment and going and doing something was very therapeutic because it was kind of like, ah, it's not all like that. You know, there's more to it. And, and so I'm very glad that I stuck with it and I'm glad that I stayed in and I'm glad that I continued to deploy and I deployed a whole bunch more after that. And that was something that, you know, I think psychologically it was a big help. And it wasn't until I did those things that I could look back and say, you know, hey, I wish that we had done more in Mogadishu. I wish that we had stayed there. Right. Uh, I wish that we, you know, once we got all our reinforcements and everything a few days later, I wish I wish that we had gone back out and done more stuff because I think it would have been different and it would have would have helped a lot of guys. It also made me realize that, um, you know, probably some of the dudes that struggle the most are, are guys that got injured that like. I wanted to be this thing and it, it, and it got cut short because I was injured significantly enough that now I can't do the thing. And, and I got left with, you know, that is my baggage, that mission as, as my baggage. And I think that that's probably the hardest place you could be psychologically, you know? So I never felt sorry for myself or felt like I was a victim of something. You know, I chose to be there and uh and participated and continued to participate um you know i think that was the, the biggest thing that i could do was honor the dudes that that died that day by continuing to take the fight you know to the bad guys right so in this you said it was very therapeutic how, how long are we away from uh being selected into delta uh, so that was 93 um after that um, I was supposed to, if I remember back to earlier, I was supposed to have gone to the, the small unit in the Rangers selection that October and obviously was in Mogadishu and couldn't, couldn't go. Right. Um, and when I got back, our platoon uh, specifically had, had taken so many casualties and, and so many dudes were banged up that I felt that it would be really shitty of me to leave and go do something else, you know, with this, the platoon in, in the state of affairs that it was. So I agreed to stay, you know, for another, however long, uh, but ended up staying, you know, about another year and a half and just kind of mentoring the new guys that were coming in and also, uh, you know, making sure that I filled a spot there and they didn't have to try and fill with somebody not from the company or, you know, something along those lines. And so, I know we can't talk a lot about your Delta stuff. Uh, a lot of that is very secret. Um, I, I guess I just want to speak about the difference between a Ranger and a Delta. And then I want to get into the, the band, the, the big part of this. Um, but is there, is there a difference? Uh, of course you're stepping up your game. As you said, it's the elite of the elite of the elite. Is there a difference? And um, is there, is there something that sets you apart being there? Um, I think with all of it, right. I, I think people have a tendency, especially people that haven't been in service or in any type of service, whether it's law enforcement or, uh, you know, I think even doctors feel the same way. Um, like one isn't better than the other. Okay. It's, it's a different job. Okay. So I don't, I don't look at, uh, being a Delta operator and say, I'm better than a Ranger or I'm okay. better than an SF guy. It's a different mission. It's a different role. Uh, it's different funding. The, the amount of training that you can do just on that compound alone, like it's, it's like equal to nothing. So 
you can't expect uh, the Rangers who don't even have radios per guy right. to operate the same way, right? It's a, it's just a completely different animal. So I ended up going, um, I ended up going from, from B company 375 to the, the small unit in the Rangers, the recon detachment and started getting some more specialized training there. And one of the other things that came as a part of that was it was all NCOs. Now there's no privates. And okay. in this, in this detachment, it's all first name basis. So I went there as an E5, my team leaders an E6, but there's a detachment sergeant who's an E7 and we're all calling each other by first names. And, and, there's an additional selection process to get there. So, you know, you're, you're kind of, uh, again, not a step above, it's just a different thing. And it's, okay. it's looking for people that are a little bit different. And I would say, you know, for going there, it was more like problem solvers and dudes that were creative and were trying to, you know, figure out different ways of doing things that weren't just in this, left, right, left, right, you know, army, army box. And, uh, anyway, so that was, that was kind of the first place that I got to. And I thought like, this is more like the way I thought it was going to be. Um, so anyway, that again, not a step up, just a step in a different direction. And, okay. um, yeah, but that was, that was, a, it was a good place to be. Um, is and there any, and Go ahead. Of, so then that, that was 95 and then uh, was there until uh, the fall of 98 when I went to selection and got selected. And so that kind of that kind of takes us through that point. But, yeah, I think I think I think your question of uh, it's definitely a like the unit in any any special mission unit um I, I like to draw parallels to the nfl right because okay. it's it's basically it's like pro level stuff you're you're in the big leagues now and Absolutely. uh i i would think that the rangers again it doesn't mean better or anything else but i think the rangers are kind of like you know high school senior football you know varsity football into like college level you know, that's kind of what that is. Like you're playing for keeps, it's real, but because they've got privates, it just kind of always keeps them in grounded in one kind of place, you know? Um, and then once you get to this place, it's like, this is the best of the best in terms of what they're looking for, the type of person that they're looking for. And I think that the thing that probably most people would be surprised at, um, I remember going to selection and seeing dudes, I'm, I'm, I'm a fit guy. Um, I'm like a little over six feet tall, 180 pounds. Um, I can run, I can climb, I can, you know, do all kinds of, you know, body stuff and things like that. <clears throat> I go to selection and there are dudes there that are jacked. And you would think, you know, looking around the group, like those guys will make it, you know, and Within, you know, a week, they're gone. And uh, you start to realize, like, wow, I'm, I'm still here. You know, what's up with that? And uh, anyway, I got some stuff I got to minimize. Um, I started to realize that, like, they're not just looking for the big UG commando. They're looking for dudes that can think. And the term that they use is cognitive dexterity and the ability to quickly and rapidly problem solve uh, on your feet. And it really comes down to, you know, that's, that's what they're looking for. But physically you have to be at a certain level to be able to accomplish whatever it is that they might task you to go do. So uh, really they're looking for dudes. And, and so anyway, the, the characteristic that uh, characteristic or personality trait that I think a lot of people would be surprised at is like this creativity piece. And, you know, just how to go skin the cat, it gets cooked up somewhere. And, you know, there are things that me as a young dude at the unit help cook up that are still being utilized today. And um, anyway, that's uh, okay, my wife texting me. That's OK. Let's let's then let's let's skip forward and talk about the band. Um, let's talk about why you made it, uh, the organizations that you work with. Um, 
listening to it, very Alice in Chains sound to me. Very of that that '90s kind of um, Stone Temple Pilots things like that. But more than anything, uh, Alice in Chains uh, to me. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, you made it because you you just couldn't figure out what to do after the military, right? You, you're trying to change gears, go into a new stage of life and just trying to figure out what to do in that new stage of life. Yeah. To some, to some degree. Yes, I do. Uh, some of the things that I do, I don't, I don't talk about on social media. Um, but I, I've helped with organizations that contribute, you know, directly to special operations, charitable organizations and things like that. So I, I do a bunch of stuff. Um, one of the things that I felt like was lacking in my own life, and this was kind of something that my wife pointed out, was like, you, you've always done this music thing. You've got all these guitars. You've got these amps and all kinds of other stuff. Like, it's a shame that you're not doing something with it. And it wasn't until then that kind of a light bulb went off. And I thought, you know, if I can put a music project together, whatever it might be, I don't even know what it's going to be at this point. Um, and I can sell music the way anybody would sell music. And I take the proceeds of music royalties and I give those to charitable organizations that I believe in, like that would be a pretty cool thing. And so that's really what it is. So I approached uh, a longtime buddy of mine, Jason Everman, who is a cat that was in both Nirvana and Soundgarden and Mindfunk uh, prior to joining the Army Rangers back in 1994. So uh, I approached him and was like, hey, man, I know you've been out of music for a long time. Uh, I don't know if you want to go back, you know, revisit the past and things like that. But, you know, I would love I can't and I can't think of anybody else I'd rather do this with than than with you. You know, would you be interested? And he was like, yeah, hell yeah. So I stood up a social media page and started to just kind of put out like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And it just organically grew. I had a former MARSOC officer hit me up and was like, Hey, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I want to be a part of it. And like, well, do you play any instruments? And he's like, yeah, I play the bass. I'm like, all right, man, like let's, let's meet up. And you know, it just I just of- run around. <laughs> so so it, it, it kind of just turned into this thing and, and grew organically to the point that we uh, connected with literally probably the, the best producer in music today. Uh, guy a, a Grammy Taylor. winner. Yeah. And just got nominated for seven Latin Grammys uh, last Tuesday. So in, insanely talented and former uh, Marine Corps guy, uh, Josh Goodwin. So he reached out and said, how can I help? I want to produce, you know, and when you guys are ready to do your record, I'll, I'll produce it and et cetera, et cetera. So we're, uh, we put an album out, uh, came out in December, and that's been doing like way better than we ever thought it would do. Um, you know, we're taking the proceeds of which, and we're going to give to two different charitable organizations. One, and originally this started as like each band member will have his charitable organization that he right. contributes to, and you know that way if we're doing media, you can talk about and, and it ended up like I do all the media, so. <laughs> Like I ended up just talking about the one that I believe in the most, uh, which is Warrior's Heart. And uh, Warrior's Heart is a physical place in Texas that helps uh, veterans and first responders. So you don't just have to be, uh, you know, a special operations veteran. You could be a first responder. You could be an EMT. You could be a doctor, whomever. But they help uh, get people treatment for uh, substance abuse and things. Cause generally PTSD isn't something that's just, Hey, I, I have brought, you know, I have right. stuff going on in my head. It's Absolutely. like all these other things that come along with it. And substance abuse is usually one of those, but they help get people clean. And then they start with PTSD counseling and therapy. And one of the things that they do that this is what I love about it is that they use art as a form of therapy. And it's something that I noticed is like, when I'm, when I'm playing this guy, like my mind can't think of anything. It's, it's, it's very therapeutic to play and it's very, even more so, uh, therapeutic to write music that I can kind of spill a lot of this dark stuff and, and negative things that have happened and kind of like put that into music. And 
So you say Alice in Chains, and I would say, like, we don't sound like Alice in Chains, but what makes us like Alice in Chains and maybe Soundgarden and uh, Stone Temple Pilots is, like, they aren't, like, happy songs. It's not, like, happy-go-lucky Van Halen songs, right? It's not, it's not, uh, right. they were partying. And, well, and, which, which Van Halen? Which right. Van Halen are we talking about? Are we talking Sammy Hagar or David Lee Roth? Uh, there's only one Van Halen. <laughs> okay, I, I knew you were going <laughs> to yeah, There's only one being done, Anyway, uh, you know, I think that the, the commonality is that I've always been drawn to like the darker music. I like the stuff that's that's edgy and it makes you feel something. Nirvana, you know, is a great example of that. Like they don't, they don't have a lot of happy songs. It doesn't mean that it's depressing music, but it, it brings something out. When I hear that stuff, it brings something out of me. And uh, anyway, it's 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 been a really cool thing. It's been uh, overwhelming the amount of like feedback I get from people or people that'll say, you know, hey, I love this song like this has helped me. It makes me cry when I hear it, whatever. And that that's been like totally mind blowing. Um, well, you have a really deep Alice in Chains song that you like, right? Yeah, I mean, they're they're. There are a bunch of them I can relate to. And I, I posted one of them earlier today that's uh, from Jar of Flies. But like Brewster is, you know, definitely one of my favorites. Down that was, yeah. you heard that one in Mogadishu, didn't you? Yeah. 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 And that, yeah. that's something that, that I connected with and, and kind of in my mind, I heard it in the middle of the battle uh, when we went back to the hangar, one of the times that we were back at the hangar and it was on uh, somebody's jam box. And I remember hearing it and thinking, you know, be the rooster, man. They're, they're, they're coming to kill the rooster. Just be the rooster. Can't kill you. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my favorite song on the album is War. <laughs> okay. Now, now I know what you're after. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm mapping out album two. And one of the songs that's on the chopping block and I know our, our drummer would agree with you on that one. He, if he could play nothing but songs like War, he would be happy with that. But um, one of the songs that's on the chopping block, and I'm not sure whether to include or not, would be War 2.0. And uh, I'm up for that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we want to make sure to include it. That's that's it's like we, you got to have that one thing that's just a hammer, you know? Yeah, and uh, it's great when you're running and stuff. That is a great song for when you're running. <laughs> Uh, what would be, you know, before we wrap this up, what would be probably the most important song to you on the album? Maybe not your favorite, but the most important song to you. Uh, there's, there's one, uh, called look after me and it, it wasn't, it's 180 degrees different than the way it was originally written. And it wasn't until we were in LA recording with Josh. Um, he was like, eh, something's not clicking. Like, grab an acoustic guitar and go in there and record, you know, do, do something different and, and cook something up. And I did pulled it, pulled it out of my ass pretty quickly. And, and it just started to work, but it, it's an acoustic song. It wasn't intended to be that way, but it's kind of like an MTV unplugged type of thing. And it's basically our, our goodbye to like all of our friends that we never had a chance to say goodbye to. And, uh, I, I don't think that a lot of people understand that side of the military. Like when you're deployed and you lose the teammate, like you're not at the memorial service. That's, that's happening while you're still deployed generally. And so there's, there's this uh, really like, there's not a lot of closure there. And so it was just something that we felt like I, I want to write a song that's like saying goodbye to all those guys that I never had a chance to say goodbye to. And it's, it's a pretty deep song. Um, and I think it has the most depth and the most layers and the most uh, everything of, of any of the songs on the album. It's, it's my favorite by far. Well, in, in wrapping this up, Brad, uh, you have had quite the storied career. Um, it, just in everything that you've been through, the way we want to help you out is on the link for this on the YouTube page, all that kind of stuff. There will be a link to warrior's heart. There'll be a link to the Marine Raider foundation. There'll be a link where to Amazon, where they can buy your album. Um, know that, that it's going to a good cause. Check these guys out. You have a Facebook group. So I want you to kind of promote all the stuff that you have social media that people can see, and then we'll wrap it up here. 
Sure. So uh, I think probably most active is a silence and light official on Instagram and also my Instagram, Brad Thomas official. Uh, I've also got a Facebook page, Brad Thomas. Uh, but, but understand that like you can get this music on Spotify, you can get it on Apple music and like 55 other streaming platforms. If you want to support warrior's heart and Marine Raider foundation, then buy it on iTunes okay. or, buy, or buy a CD because <laughs> most people don't like paying for music. So they're just, they're streaming it and that's okay. And we made a conscious decision, um, you know, basically to, to put it up for everybody. So it's, it's there. If you want to support the band, uh, you can buy merchandise. That's one of the ways that we try and like help offset cost of traveling and paying for studio. And it doesn't even come close to, to recouping costs, but I'll put that up uh, there too. The link to yeah. the website. So if, if you want to support the band and help us be able to like pay for our hotel room so that we can rehearse and things like that, buy merchandise. If you want to support Warriors Heart uh, and Marine Raider Foundation, pay for the music on iTunes or uh, buy a CD on Amazon. You can you can get stuff there. And uh, I think album two, we're going to have a lot more stuff. I think we're going to do some vinyl and oh, wow. uh, some other things like that where like there'll be special download codes. You'll only get certain songs if you buy the vinyl etc and not that everybody's going to listen to vinyl but there'll be like electronic download codes so you yeah, yeah but people buy that to be that. cool now the vinyl's yeah. back to be cool so uh we <laughs> well, will I'm definitely put your player yeah yeah <laughs> well you can do it like a target now they have them all over the place yeah. now to buy so uh once again warrior's heart marine raider foundation we will put uh the link up to both those we'll put the link up to actually the bands page where you can buy the merchandise they've got some very very cool merchandise on there to help out the band for when they're traveling um check out the album uh go to itunes or amazon that that goes into the fund to help those foundations so Listen, guys, we really appreciate you stopping by, Brad. We appreciate it so much that you did this. Uh, this has been the DTD Podcast. Check us out on Facebook at uh, the DTD Podcast, uh, on Instagram at double.speak.studios, on Twitter at DoublespeakDJ, and on YouTube at the DTD Podcast. Remember, guys, whatever you want to do in life, do that deed. That's Brad. I'm DJ. This has been the podcast. We'll catch you on the next one. See you, guys. Thanks, man.